Have you ever been in a place where you didn't fit in? <coughs> yeah, several of us can testify to that. You know, whether it was in school or a class, or maybe we're at a conference, or for some of us, maybe it was at our family reunion. You know, you go to a place and you just don't fit in. For some of Peter's original audience, when he wrote the letter of 1 Peter, this was exactly what they were facing. Uh, many of those had left all because of their relationship with Christ in the face of persecution and the vast change that has been thrust upon them seems to be too much. For some who had lived in Turkey where this letter was written to all their lives, uh, the vast difference is brought about by all these new people coming in. Uh, brought about a lot of circumstances and change and differences that they were not used to and were very uncomfortable with. And the consequence was that they were frustrated and they were angry and hurt and upset. These people that Peter writes to in his first letter, they're frustrated and they're angry and they're hurt and they're upset. They face cultural misunderstandings. They face communicational shortcomings. They face societal differences. And the result is they seem to be withdrawing from the local church. They seem to be pulling back from the local congregation. They're staying home. They're trying to find something else to do. They're, they would rather sit home and watch the football game than they would come to church. They would rather take a trip than they would come to church. They'd rather be out at the lake than they would be a part of the fellowship of the local body of faith. Not because of any failing within Jesus, but because of just the cultural differences, the difficulties that arise when more than one person gets together. Have you ever noticed that? You know, it's like the story of the man that lived on the, that lived on the deserted island. They finally come and they found him. They rescued him. And he said, wow, you've really built up some things. He goes, yeah, that's the store where I work and that's the house where I live in. This is the church where I worship. And they said, well, well, what's that building up there? He goes, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> you know, anytime you get more than, more than a couple of people together, disagreement it is a natural consequence. You know why? Because we're not all the same. We're different, and that's okay. Thank God for the differences. But as they began withdrawing from the faith, I think we can relate to their situation. As we look at their context, I think we can relate to what they were dealing with. Many of us have had experiences in the church where change in circumstances seem so overwhelming that it would just be better to stay home. Have you ever been there? You can be honest. Yeah, several of us have felt that way. Uh, we've seen how new people and new times produce change that sometimes we're not comfortable with. We've been there. <coughs> We've seen how new leadership and new ministry sometimes produce results that are unexpected. That we didn't see this coming. We didn't really realize this was going to happen. How would we have people from different walks of life, different places, when we start sharing and talking and communicating, sometimes we manage to miss each other completely. This comes as a shock from you people. Would you believe that I have not been a clear communicator being from the South to some people who have lived in the western United States their whole life. I know that would come as an amazing shock to you. That, that sometimes we just miss one another. We don't hear what the other person is saying. And in the midst of those miscommunications, it can create such hardship and frustration that we'd just rather sit at home. We'd rather pull away. We'd rather withdraw. But I believe we can learn from Peter's words in this letter this morning that we can continue moving forward living like we believe together. And so if you will, I invite you to look with me at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 26. And this will be the only time I ask you to stand this morning. Now Wayne's going to ask you to stand again at the end of the service. But I'm not going to ask you to stand up another time because of the importance of the Word of God 
We stand to honor His presence upon us. This is God's Word. And when it speaks, He speaks. And let's read what God has to say to us today in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25 this morning. By obedience to the truth, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word that was preached as the Gospel to you. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look to Your Word this morning, I pray that we would learn to live like we believe together. To realize, Father, what You've called us to and what that should look like and to glorify Yourself in the midst of it. That, Father, we would be quickened by Your Spirit and that we would be changed by an encounter with You today. And it's in Your precious and holy name we pray, Father. Amen. And you may be seated. Over the last several weeks, we've seen Peter call us to holy living because God is holy. That's an amazing concept. You be holy because God is holy. If we're God's people, we should be defined by holiness. But how do we do that? How do we live a life of holiness? And so he begins in verse 17 to explain our need for a personal confession of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then last week we discovered that we must begin to renew our minds by focusing on the facts that our circumstances are temporary, that our redemption is eternal, and that God is working in the midst of whatever we are presently facing. Now having given us those calls, a call for a personal confession of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. A call to renew our mind. He calls us to then have a craving for community. There should be a craving within our hearts for a community of faith that He has established. And so if we are to live like we believe, we must crave that community of faith and we must fulfill that craving properly. So we're going to spend the next couple of weeks discovering just what that craving looks like and how we are to fill it. Contrary to popular opinion, we are not called to a private faith. This has become so popular. You know, it used to be that the, the, the pagans would say, well, you need to just keep your faith to yourself. But now, we have people who claim to be followers of Christ who will look at your table. Well, my faith is a private matter. Nowhere in Scripture is our faith called to be a private matter. It's a personal matter. But it is a personal matter that is meant to be lived out in community. There is no call for you to find your favorite church worshiping on the top of the mountain, staring out at the grandeur of God's glory. That's what people usually tell me. But usually they have a gun in their hand and they're looking for birds. <laughs> they're looking for elk. They're looking for deer. They're not worshiping God, they're hunting. That's not church. That's recreation. And there is a place for recreation. As you all know, there's a place for recreation. And if you kill it on Sunday, the Lord requires 20% of it. <laughs> but the reality is we are not called to a private faith. It is a personal faith to be lived out in community with one another. And so as we look at the foundations of that faith, we discover that the personal call of repentance should produce an overflowing of brotherly love for the community. There should be an overflowing of brotherly love for the community. Look at what Peter starts with. He says, by obedience to the truth. And, and you know, that, that excellent call to obedience is, is really, really important. And, and it's important to obey the truth, but I had to look at this and ask a question. Well, what is the truth? 
And this is something I've discovered is most people can't read. Me alone. I, I struggle with this tremendously. Most people can't read. We really don't understand things like independent clauses, dependent clauses, asides, uh, what those commas are doing in a sentence, uh, what a prepositional phrase is. We don't understand that. We just got to go about assuming we know what the truth is. I have to be honest. Before I really began to study this, I had no idea what Peter was talking about. I really didn't. I didn't know. And so I began to really look at this and said, what truth is that? And what Peter begins to do is he reminds us <coughs> that having purified ourselves for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Well, if Peter is reminding us that we were purified to love one another, now that's in, in commas. That means that's kind of like, a, like an aside. It's an explanatory statement in there. But it doesn't really have anything to do with the main idea of the sentence. You kind of take that out to get the real idea. He says, what it really says is, by obedience to the truth, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And I looked at that and I began to realize, oh, wait a minute. He's not calling us to, to something way off here in the distance or what we think the truth might be. He's telling us clear and concisely, obey the truth. Love one another earnestly. He's calling them to the words of Christ in John 13, 34, when Jesus said, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You must also love one another. Loving one another is not simply a divine suggestion. It is the command of Christ to be obeyed. We were purified for the purpose of fulfilling this command. And we are expected to walk in obedience to it. Think about what he says in this passage. He says, having purified yourselves for sincere love of the brothers. Why were we purified? What is the purpose of the purification that is taking place because of Christ? It is to love one another. You did not get saved so you can go to heaven. The Bible never says anywhere that the purpose of salvation is so you can go to heaven. That is a benefit of salvation. That we get to enjoy the presence of God for eternity. But guess what? That is not the purpose of your salvation. You did not get saved so that you can lead excellent Bible studies. Leading excellent Bible studies is a great thing, but that is not the purpose of your salvation. You did not get saved so that you could spend 30 hours a day in prayer. Praying is an excellent thing, but that's not the purpose for your salvation. Nowhere in the Scripture is that called an explicit purpose of your salvation. You know what is called an explicit purpose of your salvation? Loving one another. You were saved, purified by God so that you would, not so that you could, so that you would love one another. You were purified by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can love one another. This love is not simply an afterthought or a situational love. You know, well, I can love you as long as it doesn't cost anything or it's not an investment of my time or my effort. This is to be done with earnest. Look at what he says there. He says, love one another earnestly. Now, that's not the guy that went to camp and went to jail and was scared stupid. That was earnest. We are to love one another earnestly. In other words, we ought to be climbing all over ourselves to love each other. Rather than doing it begrudgingly, <coughs> rather than doing it out of, out of compulsion or 
our necessity, we should want to love one another. We should be doing everything we can to love each other. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 16 and 17, this is how we have come to know love. He, talking about Jesus, laid down His life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? You know what that doesn't say? That doesn't say... If someone is the greatest Bible teacher you've ever seen, God's love resides in them. It says if love for the brothers is absent, the love of God in that life is most likely absent as well. That's a frightening thought. You know, I grew up in a time where we kind of had a checklist of things we were supposed to do in order to be holy and righteous. You know, I love lists. I'll tell you this. Our legalism reproduces our good <coughs> belief because we love someone to tell us what to do so we can be right. Now, we love that. Right, you do this, this, and this, you'll be right. Man, we used to run around with our little list and we'd check stuff off. And Man, if I prayed and read my Bible and did this and shared the Gospel, I was in good shape. This doesn't say anything about like that. It says, we would love one another. That's the evidence of God's love being present within our lives. The failure to love in an active way towards our brothers and sisters in Christ is the evidence that the love of God is absent from our lives as well. Think about that. Really think about what you're doing, how you're living, how you're engaging, where you've put the value of your relationship to Christ, where you've put the value of your relationship to the church. A church that is truly in love with God will not necessarily be the church that is illustrated by teaching Bible studies that are orthodox, although I think that's essential. They won't have the most accurate and sound theology, even though I think that's essential. They're not going to be the church where people give the most money to churchy things, although we'll take your money. They're not going to be the church that has the best competitors in Bible trivia, although knowing your Bible is great. <clears throat> but if the evidence of God's love isn't there because they don't love one another, it's just a waste of time. You know who had really great Bible studies? You know who had the most orthodox theology of their day? You know who knew the Bible backwards and forwards? The Pharisees. And you know who missed Jesus completely? The Pharisees. You see, the call of Christ is to love one another. <laughs> we cannot claim to be faithful to the Lord Jesus unless we are loving one another with honesty. This love should also be from a pure heart. It says we should love each other earnestly from a pure heart. It means our motive should be nothing less than faithful obedience to the call of Christ. You know, it's a call to faithfulness. Faithfulness is loving one another. And if you're loving one another, all those other things should be falling in place. You know, I don't love you because of what you will give me or because of what I can get out of it. You know, a lot of times that's how, how our love really does work. As long as I get something out of it, or as long as you're doing something for me, or as long as as long as, as I think it'll it'll better me in some way, I'll love you. But as soon as I can't get any more out of you or it's no longer beneficial to me to love you, well, I'm not going to. I'll find somebody else to go love. You know, that, that's, that's the way we think. You know why? Because that's human nature at its finest. At our very core, we really do believe in, believe in the, the law of nature that it's survival of the fittest. So if I can love you and improve my survivability rate a little bit, that's what I'll do. But instead, we're called to love regardless of the cost. 
regardless of the consequence, regardless of the hurt and the pain and the struggle and the suffering, we are called to love from a pure heart out of faithful obedience to Christ regardless of how bad it hurts us or how much it costs us. Folks, that ain't easy. That's why we need the love of God in our lives and the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. You can't do it in and of yourself. You're not capable. We see this love illustrated in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Where it says, God proves His love to us in this way that while we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. There was absolutely nothing God needed from us. There's always this thought, you know, God needed to save people. God did not need to save people. He was absolutely, totally, and completely self-sufficient in and of Himself. That's that concept of holiness. God's holy. There is no lacking within God anywhere. His justice would have been absolutely satisfied to take every sinner that's ever sinned to sin and send them straight to hell. God lacked nothing. But out of His love for His creation, He gave at a tremendous price, His Son, while we were still in our sins. That's the love God has for us. That's the love God calls for us to have for each other. A love that is giving, that is self-sacrificing, that does not reward. I mean, we often think that, man, it's a great reward for God that I got saved. The Scripture never talks about that. That's not part of the process. Yes, God loves you and He cares about you, but, but let's not kid ourselves. We really did deserve to go to hell. Every one of us. That's what we earn. That's what we deserve. And it's only by God's mercy that any of us will enjoy His presence for eternity. That's just the reality of the Scripture. That's the foundation of the love that God calls us to have. One that says, even though you don't deserve my love, I'm going to give it anyway. And that's the love we should have for one another. That even though you don't deserve it, even though you've hurt me, even though you've done things to me that was wrong and that, that, that I think were, were inappropriate or were not accurate or were mean or were bad or were unfaithful or were disloyal, we are to love anyway. We are to be climbing over ourselves to love that way. It's a love from a pure heart. And we are to love faithfully even at a high cost. No matter who we are dealing with, no matter what they've done, no matter where they come from, no matter where they may be going, if they are a part of the family of God, we are to earnestly love them from a pure heart because that's what we were saved to do. That's an amazing thing. Jesus would tell His disciples that the world would know we were His disciples because we loved one another. Not because we've got the greatest preacher that's ever preached a sermon anywhere. Not because we've got the biggest buildings or the best Bible studies or the greatest curriculum materials or the most money or we have the most people or we have the most fantastic cooks, which we do. And we have all of those things. It's because we love one another that the world will know where he is. Imagine the work of God that would take place in a church that was fulfilling this call. That in the life of every member was the desire to love one another earnestly and in purity and faithfulness to the Lord Jesus. That in every life the desire to put the needs of others above their own would saturate every conversation and would influence every decision. That in every misunderstanding, frustration, or hurt, a desire to love each other would be the response to that injury. Rather than a desire to get even or to pull back or to fight or to struggle or to have my own way, we would say, I'm going to love that person if it kills me. In spite of the difficulty and the hardship that loving them may cause. That desire 
desire to walk in a unity and fellowship under the love of Christ rather than a desire to have it the way I want it to be be the driving influence of what we do. That love would be the defining characteristic of our motives and our actions. And that our love for each other would only be superseded by a love for God. That that would be the birthmark of every believer and every member of the United Baptist Church. Imagine what God could do if we would just be faithful to what He's called us to. Guys, this isn't a pipe dream. It's not some vain hope. It's not some idea. Well, that can't happen. Sure it can. This is the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while I may not agree with everything Wesley ever said, I absolutely agree with this. Ought equals can. If God says we ought to do it, then the Holy Spirit provides the means and the resources for us to be able to do it. Ought equals can. It doesn't depend on you. It depends on your trust in the Holy Spirit to bring it about in your life. It depends on your willingness to be faithful in following His leadership to love earnestly from a pure heart. If we are going to walk in holiness because God is holy, we must walk in love for each other. And here's why. It says the same word that produced the gospel that was preached, bringing forth a new birth in the Lord Jesus Christ commands it. Look at what he said right there. And this is the word that was preached as the gospel to you. You've been saved. You've been brought about by the new birth, which is the word of God. And this is that word. I had to ask myself, what is that word? Well, I had to really look because I want to know, you know, when I usually share the gospel, is it come to that place where I call for repentance? Where I call for trust in Christ? Where I call for a willingness to follow Jesus? I found out that was not the New Testament invitation this morning. I began looking and, and striving at because what is this gospel that was preached? I found it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. This is the New Testament gospel right here. That we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the repent, trust, and follow. That's what believe means there. Repent, trust, and follow. And love one another as He commanded us. Think about that for a second. That command was so vital to the lifeblood of the New Testament church that that was their gospel invitation as they went about the world. To believe in Jesus and love one another as He has commanded it. What a powerful, powerful thought. That we are as commanded to love one another as we are to believe in Jesus. That those two things are not independent of themselves, but that rather we are called to believe in Jesus and love one another. So what does this look like in the local church? What does this look like in our day-to-day -day living, in our day-to-day -day engagements with one another? What does this look like? Well, first, it looks like forgiveness. If you've hurt someone either through your words or your actions, then this love requires you to go and make that right. This requires you to cross whatever barriers need to be crossed in order to bring about their opportunity to forgive you. If you have hurt someone, you go to them and you strive to make it right. But the other side of that is true. If someone has hurt you, then you go to them to let them know and offer that forgiveness. Guys, that's not easy. A lot of times, people hurt us and they never even know they hurt us. Sometimes through miscommunication, through uh, misunderstanding, sometimes intentionally. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes we hurt people intentionally because we don't like them. I mean, just be honest. But sometimes, 
People hurt us without any concept that they have. And it's our responsibility to go to that person and bring about a means for extending forgiveness to them. Richard Mills deals with that better than anybody I've ever heard. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That is so true in so many ways. All unforgiveness does, all holding on to those hurts does, is hurt our relationship with Christ and with His church. It makes it impossible for us to love earnestly because that sucker is sitting there in the background weighing us down from wherever Christ is calling us to go. It's a battle that we can't win. And we have to let it go through the power of that forgiveness. How else does it look like? It, 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 it looks like understanding. You know, sometimes there are decisions that have to be made as a church, as an individual, as a class, as a people, as a family. Sometimes there are decisions that have to be made. And everybody's not going to be happy with the decision. You know, that's just the reality of making decisions. If my children want pizza and I decide to have cheeseburgers on Tuesday night, somebody ain't going to be happy. That's just the way it is. And on a much larger scale, there are decisions that are made as a church, as an organization, as an organism for ministry, in our classes, in our homes. Their decisions are made. Where everybody's not going to be happy. But loving our brothers earnestly allows us to discuss those things openly and honestly and then move forward together in the aftermath of those decisions. Not backbiting and gossiping and complaining and trying to have our own way, but doing it in love and respect and integrity. What does that look like? It looks like compassion. That when we see a need, we respond to that need as we are able. Now look, if somebody comes to us with a bill for $10,000, the reality is we're probably not able to do that. But we respond as we are able to the needs that God brings to light in our midst. We respond as we are able to the circumstances that surround us, whether it's the lostness of Riverton, whether it is the struggles within our homes and in our families, whether it's in helping provide a babysitter because someone has a job interview, or whether it's helping provide a night out for a couple of parents who are on the verge of killing one another because of their children or each other. Sometimes they just about kill each other because of each other. But we demonstrate compassion by meeting the needs as God makes them evident among us. What does this look like? It looks like what you think it looks like. It looks like brotherly love earnestly given from a pure heart. Every one of you know what that looks like. Because we've seen it through what Christ did for us. We should be willing to do that for others. Today you may not have been producing brotherly love in your life. Maybe in your life you've been producing strife, hurt, anger, frustration, or fear. Maybe you've allowed gossip, slander, backbiting, unfaithfulness, dishonesty, or divisiveness to become the defining characteristic of your life. That if you were to pull out the birthmark of your spirituality right now, one of those things would be the birthmark that's on display. Not love. Not brotherly love. Maybe pride. Maybe unfaithfulness. But not love. This morning you know that it's time to wash that away and take a new marking under the authority of Jesus Christ. It's time to start living like we believe. In just a moment, I'm going to invite us to pray. During that prayer, I'm going to make my way down to the field. Wayne's going to come back to the platform to lead us in our invitation. When I finish that prayer, Wayne's going to ask you to stand. He's going to ask you to turn to a hymn number. And we're going to begin to sing. 
This morning, if you need to rededicate yourself to the New Testament call, the call to believe in Jesus and to love one another as Christ commanded, then I want to invite you to respond today. Maybe you just need to come and settle things at the altar and just pray between you and your Savior. Maybe you want to pray with me. Maybe you need to get with somebody in this room and pray with them. But this morning, if Christ is speaking to your heart, the Holy Spirit has gripped you with conviction. And you know that you need to rededicate yourself to Christ's call to loving one another as Christ loved us. To dedicate yourself to His call to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And this morning, that is your invitation. And on the first words of that song, all you need to do is step in any one of these eyes and meet me right down front here and pray at these altars, get with someone in this room that you may need to set things up with, whatever it is. But it is your invitation to respond. We will never live like we will if we fail to live any way that is less than what Christ has called us to. We will never live like we believe if we live in unfaithfulness to His call to love one another earnestly from the pure heart. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this time as we begin our time.